Chapter Ten of Watch and Wait, The Young Fugitives by Oliver Optic. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Ten, Breakfast on Board the Isabel. Now, Sid, get up the furnace and make a fire," said Dan, as soon as the sails of the Isabel had been furled and the boat carefully secured to a tree on the shore. Sartin," replied Sid, as he took off the hatch of the stowhold. Who's gwine to be to cook, Dan? Do you know how to cook, Sid? Hossifus, I don't know nothin' at all about it. Neither do I, and I think Lily does not. I will try my hand at the business first. We can make some coffee, boil the potatoes, and fry the bacon. I am sure I can do that. So can Sid. Just as soon as we get to the place where we are going, we will divide the work between us. You shall be cook one week, and I will the next week. Now bring up the bacon, the potatoes, and the coffee. Old Jake, who was to do the cooking for the excursionists, had provided everything that would be needed for the purpose. In a short time, the fires were blazing in the two furnaces. The coffee and the potatoes were boiling upon one, and the other was in readiness for the frying pan. When the other articles should be in a sufficiently forward state to require its use. Though Dan had never actually turned his hand to the business of cooking, he had so often seen the various operations performed that he was competent to do it himself, after acquiring a little experience. He was a keen observer, and whenever he saw anything done, he could generally do it himself. In the forward part of the cabin of the Isabel, reaching from the foremast to the centerboard was a fixed table and while dan was cooking the bacon sid prepared it for the morning meal they had everything which could be found in any well-ordered house and the table had more the appearance of that of a first-class hotel than one provided for the use of the runaway slaves possifus exclaimed sid when the table was ready as he sat down upon the berth to observe the effect dat's berry fine Sid, you's gwine to set down to dat table. You's a free nigger now, Sid, and just as good as de best ob dem. Dar's de bread, dar's de pickles, dar's de butter, dar's de sugar, dar's de milk, dar's de salt, dar's de castor. Gossifus, all dat's berry fine, and Sid's gwine to set down at de fust table. Here, Sid called dan through the skylight as he proceeded to pass down the breakfast put them on the table mossifus do you think sid don't know what to do with dese yar things i know what fried bacon's fur the potatoes the bacon and the coffee were handed down and when they were placed upon the table the effect called forth another rhapsody from sid while he was apostrophizing the bacon and the potatoes he was joined by dan Come, Lily, said he. Breakfast is ready. Hossifus, we forgot one thing for sartin, exclaimed Sid, suddenly looking as sober as though he had not a friend in the world. What, Sid? De bell. Bell? What do we want of a bell? To call de folks to breakfast, to be sure, replied Sid, distending his mouth from ear to ear. I think we can get along without a bell, replied Dan laughing at the folly of his companion lily joined the boys in the forward cabin as they called the space forward of the centre board she looked as pleased and happy as dan and sid and one would hardly have believed from their appearance that they were fugitives from slavery all the talk about the chilly damps of the swamp the perils and the hardships of the flight appeared to have been forgotten the planter and his son could hardly have been more jovial than the party which had taken possession of the yacht. Sid was not accustomed to the refinements of social life, as Dan and Lily had been, and he began to behave in a very indecorous and remarkable manner. As it was all in the family, Dan ventured to suggest to him that, as he was now seated at a gentleman's table, he should behave in a gentlemanly manner and not eat bacon from his fingers when a knife and fork had been especially provided for this purpose sid accepted the rebuke and thereafter imitated the manners of his companions even carrying his ideas of gentility to extremes the cooking was a decided success 
with the exception of the coffee, which was very muddy and uninviting. This was not strange, inasmuch as none of the chemical conditions upon which good coffee is produced had been complied with. It was nothing but coffee and water stewed together. Dan was mortified and apologized for the failure. "'How did you make it, Dan?' asked Lily with a smile, which fully spoke the offender's pardon. "'I put the coffee in and then the water,' replied the amateur cook with a blush. "'Hot water?' "'No, cold.' Lily laughed aloud at this blunder, and then gave him a receipt for making good coffee, which included the use of boiling water and fish skin. "'I saw that fish skin in the locker, and I couldn't think what it was for,' laughed Dan. But the breakfast was finished, and, in spite of the drawback of poor coffee, it was pronounced satisfactory, especially by Sid, whose plantation rations had not included coffee, butter, white bread, and other articles which graced the table of the Isabel. "'Now, Dan and Sid, you can go away and do what you please,' said Lily. "'We will clear up the table and wash the dishes first, replied Dan. "'No, I am going to do that.' "'You, Lily?' I am going to do my share of the work. I can't manage a boat, but I think I can cook and take care of the cabin, set the table, and do everything that belongs to the women. I didn't mean to have you work, Lily, said Dan. You have been a lady's maid all your life and never did any work. Well, I know how, and I'm going to do my share. I should not feel right to live like a lady here. I mean to do all the work in the cabin and the cooking, too. No, Sid and I will do that. Mossifus, do all that and de rest too. I must do something or I should be very unhappy. Well, Lily, you shall have your own way, and while you are clearing off the table, Sid and I will prepare the ladies' cabin. The what? asked Lily. Your cabin. You shall have a room all to yourself. Dan left the cabin, followed by Sid taking from one of the lockers in the standing room an awning which was used to spread over the forward deck he unrolled it and proceeded to make his calculations while sid stood by scratching his head and wondering what was going to be done the cabin of the isabel was entered by two doors one on each side of the centerboard which divided the after cabin into two apartments dan after measuring the cabin cut the awning to the size required, and then nailed it up as a partition between the forward and the after cabin. The space thus enclosed formed a stateroom, six feet long and three feet wide, outside of the berth. This room could be entered only by the door from the standing room. It made a very neat and comfortable chamber, and Lily was much pleased with it. By the time the dishes were washed and put away, there was considerable gaping among the party. Sid opened his mouth fearfully wide, and Miss Lily's eyelids drooped, like her fragrant namesake, when its mission on earth is nearly finished. The fugitives had come to the knowledge that they had slept none during the preceding night, and as the voyage was to be continued when darkness favored the movement, it was necessary that the hours should be appropriated to slumber. Lily retired to her new stateroom, closed the door, and was soon asleep. "'Now, Sid, one of us must turn in,' said Dan. "'Can't we both turn in?' "'No. One of us must stand watch while the other sleeps. We have been getting along so finely that we have almost forgot that we are in danger.' "'Possifus!' gasped Sid. "'What, what, what you want to keep watch fur? "'Suppose any one should come upon us while we are asleep,' added Dan." Pose any one come pon us when we're awake. What din? Who's a gwine to help hisself? yawned Sid. I am for one. I shall not be taken if I can help it. Gossifus, what you gwine to do? Pose you see de nigger hunter with tree four dozen bloodhounds. Well, well, what you gwine to do den? I'm going to fight, and you must do the same, replied Dan with energy as he grasped one of the fowling pieces that lay upon the bunk. "'Gwine to fight!' cried Sid, opening his eyes with astonishment. "'Gwine to kill de dogs and kill de men? That's what I mean. I will shoot man or dog that attempts to touch me. "'Wha, wha, wha!' stammered Sid, as he always did when excited. 
but the idea was too big for him just then, and he broke down altogether. That's a settled point, and you must learn to use a gun. Who, who, who would you shoot, Massa Colonel, if he come far to take you? demanded Sid. I would, or any other man. I belong to myself now, and I will fight for my own freedom to the last. I don't know about that, Dan, mused Sid. Hossifus, shoot Massa Colonel. Don't know about that. Turn in, Sid, and go to sleep. You may have the first chance. The two boys drew lots for the choice of berths, and Dan obtained the after one. Sid was soon snoring in one of the forward bunks, while Dan took his place upon deck to guard against the approach of man or beast that might threaten their newly acquired freedom. End of chapter 10 Recording by Scarlet, Louisiana Chapter 11 of Watch and Wait, The Young Fugitives by Oliver Optic. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 11 The Bay of the Bloodhounds. Dan had his solitary watch for four hours, with nothing to disturb his meditations except the occasional visit of an alligator. But as the ugly reptiles did not offer to swallow the boat or otherwise interfere with her, the lonely sentinel did not even challenge the intruders. He was very sleepy, for he had not closed his eyes during the preceding night, and his great purpose had sadly interfered with his slumbers since the time for its execution had been fixed. It was one o'clock when he called the watch below. Lily was still wrapped in slumber, worn out by her sleepless night, and by the excitement of her novel position. After charging Sid to keep awake, assuring him that eternal vigilance was the price of liberty, Dan went into the cabin to obtain the rest he so much needed. He slept soundly, and, no doubt, dreamed strange things. But when he awoke, it was nearly dark. Starting up with a spring, he bounded to the deck, where he found Sid, fast asleep, upon the cushions of the standing-room. Sid! exclaimed he, seizing the faithless sentinel by the collar. Is this the way you keep watch? Possifus! ejaculated Sid, as he sprang to his feet. I done been asleep. Been asleep? I should think you had. Have you been snoring there all the afternoon? No, sir. Dis child hadn't been sleep more'n two minutes. No, sir, nor more'n a minute and a half. "'Yes, you have. You have been asleep all the afternoon. "'You deserve to be a slave all the rest of your life,' added Dan indignantly. "'Gossifus, I tink not. "'Wha, wha, wha, what does you mean by dat? stuttered Sid. "'How dared you go to sleep when you were on watch?' "'I tell you, Dan, I's been wide awake all the afternoon. "'Hadn't been asleep quite two minutes.' "'He hasn't slept long, Dan,' said Lily, as she came out of the cabin, "'for I was with him only a little while ago.' "'I'm glad of it if he hasn't,' added Dan more calmly. "'You can bit your life, dis child don't go to sleep on de watch. "'No, sir!' "'But you did go to sleep, Sid. "'You were asleep when I came on deck.' "'I just closed my eyes for a minute, "'but I was just gwine to wake up when you come down deck.' I can't keep awake all the time. I must sleep some. About six hours, chuckled Sid, and his companion had really slept about this time. Why did you call me then, as I did you? I told him not to do so, Dan, interposed Lily, whose sweet smile was sure to remove any objection which Dan might have. We ate our supper about an hour ago. Sid was going to call you, but I wouldn't let him. I knew how tired you were, and you will not have any chance to sleep tonight. It was very kind of you, Lily, said Dan with a smile, but I must teach Sid not to sleep when he is on watch. Any carelessness of this kind might spoil everything. I'll never go to sleep on de watch again, so help me, Possifus, 
exclaimed Sid, now fully impressed by the magnitude of his criminal neglect. I'll answer for him, said Lily. I'll stay on deck and keep him awake next time. Oh, no, you need it, Lily. But why can't I keep watch in the daytime and let both of you sleep? If there was any danger, I could call you. I don't mean to ask you to keep watch or do any such work. It is not a woman's place. I mean to take my turn next time, said she resolutely. Now, Dan, I will get your supper. Sid and I ate bread and butter and drank cold water. But if you are going to sail the boat all night, you will want some tea. Thank you, Lily. You are very kind. I will get the tea myself. No, you shall not. I am not going to be idle all the time. I mean to do my share of the labor. If it isn't a woman's work to keep watch, it is to get tea. And if you please, I will do it myself. My young readers will remember that Lily, though a slave girl, was a gentle, delicate creature. She had never done any manual labor. She had simply stood by her young mistress, fanned her when she was warm, brushed away the flies, handed her a book or other article when she wanted it, picked up her handkerchief when she dropped it, and assisted at her toilet. If Miss Edith needed any greater exertion of bone and muscle, another person was called to render the service. But she had been about the kitchen and workrooms of the plantation, and having a taste for the various housekeeping operations, she had incidentally acquired some little skill in cooking, needlework, and other branches of female industry. Her form was agile and graceful, her organization delicate, and no person, even with a knowledge of her social condition, and rankly imbued with southern prejudices, could have denied that she was beautiful in form and feature. Her complexion was fairer than that of a majority of Anglo-Saxon maidens. Her eye was soft and sweetly expressive. Such was Lily, the slave girl of Redlawn, and when she talked of performing the drudgery of the Isabel, Dan, with that chivalrous consideration for the gentler sex which characterizes the true gentleman, resented the idea. He preferred to labor day and night, rather than permit her to soil her white hands with the soot of the furnaces. Lily, as we have seen, had wiser and more sensible ideas on the subject. She had an instinctive contempt for that sort of chivalry, and in spite of the remonstrances of the knightly skipper of the Isabel, she kindled a fire, and with the assistance of Sid, soon placed the tea and bread and butter upon the cabin table. She then took her place at the head of the board, and did the honors with an elegance and grace which would have adorned the breakfast parlor at Redlawn. Though Sid had been to supper, he accepted the invitation to repeat the operation. Before the meal was commenced, it was necessary to light the cabin lantern which swung over the table. Whether there is any exhilaration in a cup of tea or not, the party soon became very cheerful, and Sid was as chipper as though he were in the midst of the Christmas holidays. After supper, Dan took the bateau and pulled out to the lake, to reconnoitre the position and assure himself that there were no obstacles to the departure of the Isabel. When he returned, Lily had washed the dishes and put the cabin in order, thus carrying her point and establishing herself as mistress in this department. Dan did not deem it prudent to start so early in the evening, but the sails were hoisted and everything made ready for the departure. The wind was light, and the leader of the expedition had some doubts about starting at all that night. The Isabel had made only about twenty miles during the preceding night with a strong breeze to help her during a portion of the time. He had carefully studied the maps in his possession, and estimated the distances by the scale between the various points. He knew exactly where he intended to go, and a failure to reach the place before daylight would expose him to the risk of being seen from some of the plantations on the banks of the lake. The responsibility of deciding this important question rested upon him alone. The distance to be accomplished before they could reach another place of security was about twenty-five miles, 
an average of three miles an hour would enable him to complete the passage by sunrise, and he at last decided to attempt it. About nine o'clock the two boys got into the bateau and towed the Isabel out of the creek, and with gaff topsails and staysail set, in addition to the jib, fore, and mainsails, the voyage was renewed. Keeping as near the western shore of the lake as it was prudent to go, the boat glided gently over the tranquil waters. In a couple of hours the Isabel reached the narrow outlet of the lake. Thus far, the southwesterly wind had enabled her to run with a free sheet, but at this point the course changed, and Dan found that he should be compelled to beat dead to windward in order to reach his destination. Then he wished he had not started, but up the creek he had been unable to determine from what direction the light breeze came, and had decided the question to the best of his ability. Though he had no reason to reproach himself for his want of care, the situation was none the less difficult or trying on that account. But there was one compensating advantage as he passed through the narrow outlet of the lake. The broad surface of the Chetamacha was before him. It was forty miles long by ten miles wide, and afforded him abundant space in which to work the boat, and in this open sea the wind came unobstructed to his sails. The course of the Isabel on her first tack lay close to the eastern shore of the lake. The boat moved very slowly through the water, and Lily and Sid sat by the side of the skipper, talking in low tones of the future with its hopes and its trials, its joys and its dangers. Suddenly they heard a crackling sound in the cane break near them. Then came, from a greater distance, the bay of bloodhounds. There was no mistaking these sounds, and for an hour they listened in almost breathless anxiety to these appalling indications of a slave hunt. The yelp of the dogs came nearer and nearer but they had lost the sounds which indicated the presence of the hunted fugitive. Gossifus, whispered Sid, for he had been forbidden to speak a loud word. Where you pose de nigger dem dogs is chasin' is? I don't know. I pray that he may escape, replied Dan. Can't you help him? asked Lily, whose frame shook with terror, as her fancy pictured the terrible scene which she had so often heard described. A splash in the water a hundred yards astern of the Isabel now attracted the attention of the party. "'Can't you help him?' repeated Lily in trembling tones. "'It will not be safe for us to show ourselves, for the human bloodhounds are not far off.' "'Do help him if you can. Save him from those terrible dogs,' pleaded Lily." He will swim to that island, said Dan. Perhaps the dogs will not catch him. Yes, they will. Yes, they will. They done lep in de water. There they go, added Sid, as they listened to the splashes as the brutes sprang into the lake. Save him! Save him, Dan! cried Lily. It may cost us our lives and our liberty, replied Dan. No matter! Let us die if we can save the poor man from the fangs of the bloodhounds. I will, Lily, replied Dan, as he put the Isabel about and headed towards the small island, about half a mile from the shore. Take the helm, Sid, continued he, as he left his post at the tiller and rushed into the cabin. He returned in a moment with two fowling pieces in his hands and proceeded to load them. By this time, the panting fugitive was distinctly seen, closely pursued by the dogs. End of chapter 11 Recording by Scarlet, Louisiana Chapter 12 of Watch and Wait, The Young Fugitives by Oliver Optic This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 12 Quinn the runaway. Dan had loaded the fowling pieces with buckshot. Though not a good marksman, he had some experience in the use of arms, 
and felt fully competent to cut off the bloodhounds before they could pounce upon their human prey. Leaving Sid at the helm, he went forward and stationed himself at the heel of the bowsprit. The dogs were better swimmers than the fugitive, and were rapidly gaining upon him, for the poor creature's limbs seemed to be partially paralyzed by the appalling danger that menaced him. The Isabel was approaching the scene of this exciting race with a rapidity which promised soon to terminate the affair. Dan immediately obtained a correct idea of the relative positions of the dog and the man. His object was to run the boat between them, and thus cut off the savage beasts from their prey. "'Luff a little, Sid,' said he. "'Luff em tis,' replied the helmsman, who was boatman enough to understand the nautical phrase, and even to handle the craft under the direction of a more skilful skipper. "'Steady as she is.' "'See here, Dan. Is you gwine to shoot?' asked Sid. "'Certainly I am.' What do you suppose I got the guns for? Possifus, what you gwine to shoot? The dogs, of course. Luff a little, luff. You are letting her fall off. Luff em tis. See here, Dan. You be mighty careful you don't hit the nigger. Silence. Now you mind your helm. You are steering wild. Sid had so far improved in the cultivation of the quality of obedience on shipboard that he did not speak again but he was fearfully excited by the stirring scene which was transpiring near him. Dan was not less moved, though his cool determination produced a different manifestation of his feelings. He was conscious of the danger to which his interference in the hunt subjected him. There were probably several slave hunters on the track of the fugitive. The Isabel would be seen by them and possibly be recognized, which would certainly bring pursuers upon her track but it was not in his nature to permit his suffering fellow-creature, in this unequal strife, to be conquered by his human and brute antagonists. The appeal of the gentle Lily had been addressed to a sympathizing heart, and he entered with all his soul upon the task of saving the slave from the fangs of his pursuers. The Isabel had now come within a few yards of the dogs and their prey. The time for action had come. Dan was fully sensible of the great crime, as the southern slave law regarded it, of shooting a nigger dog. But with a steady hand, though his heart bounded with exciting emotions, he raised the gun to his shoulder, and taking deliberate aim at the nearest hound, he fired. The brute gave a deep yell, and for some time continued to splash about in the water. "'Don't shoot me, Massa! Don't shoot me, and I'll give myself up!' cried the fugitive, who seemed to have heard the report of the gun, without observing the effect which the shot had produced. "'I mean to save you,' replied Dan, as he leveled the gun at another of the dogs. But this time he missed his aim, and the hound continued to swim towards the negro. "'Luff a little more,' said Dan to Sid as the boat came between the man and the dogs. Luff em tis! As the boat now divided the dogs from their prey, Dan did not again load the guns, but seizing the boat-hook, he gave the foremost hound a knock on the head, which caused him to retreat, howling with pain. Swim this way, cried Dan to the negro. I will save you. Yes, sir, gasped the negro, whose breath was nearly exhausted by the hard struggle through which he had just passed. As the Isabel luffed up, the fugitive came alongside, and Dan assisted him to climb upon the deck. "'Oh, Lord!' groaned he, as he threw himself at full length upon the forecastle. "'Poor fellow!' sighed Lily, who ran forward to see the sufferer as soon as he was hauled on board." What can we do for him? He needs rest. He is all worn out. He may have run for miles before he took to the water. Can't we give him something? There is some cold tea in the cabin. I will get him something, added Dan, and he ran aft and entered the cabin. He returned in a moment with a bottle and a tumbler. The fugitive still lay upon the deck, 
panting and groaning like a dying gladiator after the mortal struggle of the arena. Freedom was worth the exertion he had made, though every fiber in his frame had been strained. He had manfully fought the battle, though without the interference of our party he would certainly have lost the day. Dan poured out a tumblerful of the wine which the bottle contained, and placed it at the lips of the sufferer. He eagerly drank off the draught, and sank back upon the deck. "'He will be better soon. He is all out of breath,' said Dan, as he brought one of the cushions from the standing-room, and put it under the poor man's head. "'Gossifus!' shouted Sid, who still retained his position at the helm, though his interest in the scene of the forward deck caused him to steer very badly. "'Hossifus!' added he, in gasping tones. "'De dogs! De dogs!' "'What's the matter, Sid?' demanded Dan. "'De dogs! Dey done eat dis child all up. Dey won't leave de ghost ob a grease spot. Luffa dis nigger!' cried Sid in mortal terror. "'Mind how you steer, then,' replied Dan, hastening to the assistance of his terrified companion. Don't you see you have thrown her up into the wind, so that the sails don't draw a bit? Mas of us, dis child don't want to be food for de dogs. You will be, if you don't mind what you are about, said Dan, as he took the tiller, and putting it up, the boat gathered fresh headway, and soon shot out of reach of the bloodhounds. Why don't you shoot de wicked dogs? I don't want any more noise. I hate the dogs as bad as you do, but we must be careful, replied Dan. Now, can you mind what you are about and keep the sails full? Dis child can do dat for sartin. If you don't, the dogs will have you. Now be careful, and I will go forward and take care of the poor fellow who is nearly dead. Watch the sails. Never mind the dogs. They can't catch you if you sail the boat properly. You can trust dis child for dat. Sid isn't afeard of nothing, only he don't want to be eat up by de wicked dogs. Dan went forward where Lily was bending over the panting runaway, rubbing his temples and speaking sweet words of hope and comfort to him. In a short time he was in some measure recovered from the effects of his fearful struggle with the fate that beset him. I was sure I was caught when I saw de boat said he, as he raised himself to a sitting posture, and gazed with astonishment at those who had so singularly proved to be friends, instead of foes. "'Are there any men on your track?' asked Dan, who could not lose sight of the peril he had incurred by the Samaritan act. "'I spect there is,' replied he. "'I hear dem off ever so far, but I don't see dem. "'Can they chase you on the lake?' I spect they can. They'll get a boat and holler de dogs. Where are you from? asked Lily. From Major Pembroke's plantation, about ten miles from Desier parts, I spect. How long since you run away? I left a place about three days ago. I stay in de cane break till noon today, and get so hungry I can stand it no longer. Then I goes out to find something to eat. Then somebody sees me, and they follow me with de dogs. I didn't kill two of dem dogs, and I killed the rest, but I hear de men coming, and I run for de lake. I speck when I get in de water to fro de dogs off de scent, but they get so near they see me and hear me. Dem's mighty fine nigger dogs, or they never follow me into de water. I done give it all up when I hear dem in de water after me. Didn't you get anything to eat when you went out of the cane break? asked Lily. No, Missy, I got seen for I find anything. Poor fellow, then you haven't had anything to eat for three days? Nothing but leaves and de bark of trees. I will give you some supper at once, said Lily, as she hastened to the cabin. Lily, called Dan, you mustn't light the lantern or make a fire. Why not? The light would betray us. The slave hunters will soon be out in their boat after this man. I will not, then. While Lily was engaged below, Dan provided the runaway with a suit of his own clothes, which were not much too small for him, as he was a man of medium stature. He then conducted him to the standing-room, for he was still too weak to walk without support. His supper was brought up, 
and he ate cold bacon and potatoes, bread and cheese, till the wondering Lily thought he would devour their whole stock of provisions, and till Dan kindly suggested that he would make himself sick if he ate any more. While he was eating, Dan satisfied his curiosity in regard to the Isabel and the party on board of her. The runaway, whose name was Quinn, an abbreviation of Quincy, listened with astonishment to the story of these elegant fugitives who ran away in a yacht and lived in a style worthy of a planter's mansion. No doubt he thought their experience was poetical and pretty compared with his own, for his flight had been a death struggle with famine and flood, with man and brute. In the meantime, the Isabel had run the dogs out of sight, and the waters in the direction from which she had just come were as still as death. No doubt the lake would be scoured in search of the fugitive, but for the present the party seemed to be secure from pursuit. The boat was now approaching the northern shore of the lake, and it became necessary to tack. The wind held steady but light, and Dan had but small hopes of being able to reach his destination before daylight. When everything was made snug on the other tack, and there seemed to be no present danger ahead or astern, Sid conducted Quinn to one of the forward berths, and he turned in for the night. The runaway was evidently a very pious slave, and the young fugitives listened with revered interest to the long prayer he offered up before he retired. It was a prayer of thanksgiving for his escape from the fangs of the slave hunters. It was homely speech, but it was earnest and sincere, and those who listened were deeply impressed by its fervid simplicity. Dan and Lily sat alone in the stern of the boat, for Sid had been permitted to turn in with the runaway. They talked of freedom and the future for an hour, and then they were started by the sound of oars in the distance. The slave hunters were on their track. End of chapter 12 Recording by Scarlet, Louisiana Chapter 13 of Watch and Wait The Young Fugitives by Oliver Optic This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 13 The Night Chase on the Lake Though the Isabel carried all her extra sails, the wind was so light that she made very little progress through the water, and the sound of oars which indicated the approach of a boat was appalling to Dan. There could be no doubt that it contained the slave hunters in pursuit of Quinn, and the fate of the whole party seemed to be linked with that of the slave, who was sleeping in happy security in the cabin. The schooner was close-hauled, and sailing as near the wind as she could. But Dan, as soon as he realized the peril of the situation, gave the boat a couple of points, which sensibly increased her speed. When he first heard the pursuer's boat, it was just a beam of the Isabel. His present course, therefore, carried him nearer to the boat for a time, but it was not safe to permit her to get to the windward of the Isabel in that light breeze. Dan was satisfied that, if he had been in the four-oar boat with his black crew, he could have overhauled the Isabel in a short time. If the two craft had been in the positions occupied by the pursuer and the pursued, the race depended entirely upon the character of the boat in which the slave hunters had embarked. Whatever the result of the pursuit, Dan was fully determined not to be taken himself, nor to permit his friends on board to be taken. With the arms in the cabin, he was confident that he could make a good defense. But the thought of taking the life, even of a slave hunter, was terrible to him, though he had fully reasoned himself into the belief that such a course would be perfectly justifiable before God and he cared little for the judgment of a slave-holding community. His Maker had given him the right to be free, had endowed him with the right to use his own bone and sinew for his own benefit and happiness, 
and the man or the community that attempted to deprive him of this right committed a crime against God and him, and it was his duty to defend himself against this violation of his heaven-given right. He hoped, however, to be spared the pain of resorting to the use of arms. He prayed to God, with all the earnestness of an earnest nature, for more wind, for his creed, if he had any, was very simple, and included a belief in special providences. The boat of the slave hunters was now not more than half a mile distant, and the chase had become intensely exciting to Dan and Lily, who alone were on deck. The trembling maiden could with difficulty maintain a reasonable self-possession. She was terrified as the panting hare when she feels the warm breath of the pursuing hound. "'We shall certainly be taken, Dan,' said she, as she caught sight of the boat beneath the main boom of the schooner. "'We are lost!' "'No, Lily, not lost. You shall never be taken while I have a drop of blood left in my body,' replied Dan, in a low and earnest tone." "'Why, they are ever so much nearer than they were when we first saw them.' "'That is true, but it is only because I changed the course of the boat.' "'Why did you change it, then?' "'Because, if I run her down into the corner of the lake, they can easily cut us off.' "'I suppose you have done the best you could.' "'There was no other way to do,' answered Dan, as he glanced under the boom at the pursuer." We shall soon know which boat goes the fastest now. I don't understand it all, said Lily, whose knowledge of seamanship was very limited. You know the shape of the letter A? I do. Well, that boat has been running up one leg of the A, and I have been running up the other. So, you see, we must be coming nearer together. I had to run this way in order to use the wind to the best advantage. But you will come together in this way in a few moments. No, we are as near now as we can be, unless that boat sails faster than we do. I shall continue to sail in a straight line, but I shall get ahead of the other if she does not change her course. She cannot cut me out now at any rate." Probably Lily was willing to talk of this subject to banish more painful thoughts from her mind, though it is not likely that she clearly comprehended the tactics of the skipper of the Isabel. "'Don't you think I had better call Sid and Quinn?' asked she, after she had again glanced at the position of the pursuing boat. "'No, let them sleep. We will not call them till it is necessary to do so,' replied Dan." "'Do you think we can escape them?' asked she anxiously. "'I cannot tell, Lily. I hope so. It depends entirely upon the wind. If the breeze should die out, of course we could make no progress at all.' "'Do you think the wind will die out?' said she nervously. "'I can't tell, Lily. I hope not. I pray not.' "'Suppose it should die out, Dan?' added she, moving up nearer to the skipper. If we lose the wind, there is nothing to prevent the boat from overtaking us at once. Oh, dear, shuddered Lily, moving up still nearer to him, who was her only earthly protector. Why do you tremble so, Lily? asked Dan, as he took her hand and pressed it in his own, perhaps thinking that he might thus impart to her some of his own steadiness because I am so terribly frightened, replied she, with quivering lips. I would rather die than be taken, and I have been thinking that I would throw myself into the lake if the boat catches us. You shall not be taken, Lily, said Dan, his lips compressed, and his teeth tightly closed, evincing the determination with which he had resolved to meet the slave-hunters if they attempted to lay their polluting hands upon the gentle girl by his side. "'What can you do against such men as those?' "'I can fight, Lily. I would do so to save myself, but more to save you.' "'Oh, heaven! 
if I should be taken, what would become of me? No, no, Lily, don't think on so, said Dan, as he passed his arm around her waist, a familiarity in which he had never before indulged, but which was done only as a father clasps his child. To inspire her with more confidence, to assure her that she was in the care of one who was able and willing to save her from the dreadful fate that impended. "'I wish I could be as brave as you are, Dan,' said she, confidingly, for the expedient of her devoted friend seemed not to be without some effect. "'You don't appear to be at all alarmed.' "'because I have firmly resolved not to be taken myself, "'and not to let you be taken. "'I suppose they only want Quinn. "'They cannot have him. "'He is a fugitive, like ourselves, "'and I don't believe God would permit us to escape "'if we should wickedly abandon him. "'Nor I. "'We won't do that. "'We will all be taken together,' said Lily whose sympathy for the hunted runaway seemed, for the moment, to give her new courage. "'Do you suppose they know anything about us?' asked she. "'Perhaps they do. I suppose Colonel Rabin has sent hunters in every direction for us, and has probably offered a reward.' "'Then we shall certainly be taken,' answered Lily with a shudder. "'We will not be taken, Lily, whoever pursues us.' "'Hallo! In the boat there!' shouted a man of the pursuing party. The slave hunters were now within less than a quarter of a mile of the Isabel, for they had been gaining upon her by a vigorous use of their oars. The boat which contained them was now exactly astern of the schooner. "Hallo!" replied Dan, who, knowing that the men could not talk and row to the best advantage, was quite willing to converse with them. "'What boat's that?' shouted the spokesman of the slave hunters. "'Captain Barrett's,' replied Dan, whose virtue was not sufficiently developed to induce him to tell the truth in his present perilous situation. "'Where from?' "'Down below Brasher,' answered Dan, who had previously made up his mind what to say if any conversation with the pursuers should become necessary.' "'What ye doin' up here?' "'Came up with a party.' "'Seen a runaway nigger in the water?' "'No!' shouted Dan promptly. The question filled him with hope, for it assured him the slave hunters had not been near enough even to hear the report of the fowling pieces when he fired them, or at least not near enough to discover who had fired them. "'Didn't ye see him?' asked the pursuers again. No! Gossifus! Wha, wha, what's the matter? demanded Sid, rushing up from the cabin with Quinn, both of them having been awakened from their slumbers by the voice of the skipper. Silence, Sid, said Dan in a low, decided tone. Hush, Sid, added Lily in a whisper. Don't speak a word. Wha, 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 "'Hush, Sid,' repeated Lily, who seemed in the moment of danger to be endowed with a self-possession at variance with her former timidity. "'Where are you bound now?' called the slave hunter. "'Home,' replied Dan. They asked no further questions for a time, and Dan saw, with a thrill of satisfaction, that they were lying upon their oars— he hoped that his answers had convinced them the runaway was not on board. But in this he was disappointed. He heard the men in the boat talking together, though he could not make out what they said. When the conference was ended, they renewed their efforts to overtake the Isabel. "'Hello, the schooner!' shouted the spokesman again. "'Hello, the boat!' replied Dan. "'Heave to!' and let us see you in a minute. What for? Want to talk with you. Can't stop. Guess ye can. Haven't ye seen nary nigger? No. Well, stop, won't ye? 
can't stop must get home by sunrise will ye must stop yelled the speaker angrily and with an oath hossifus groaned sid in mortal terror shut up sid added dan sternly if you can't hold your tongue i'll throw you overboard pacifus ugh wa 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 come sid interposed quinn in a low tone don't make a noise if you do we shall all be lost dis child's awful skeered i done wish i hadn't come replied sid in a gentler tone but the words trembled on his lips quinn said dan sar replied the fugitive with a self-possession which thoroughly shamed the quaking sid take hold of the painter of the bateau and haul it alongside yes sar sid take hold and help him haul it up to the foremast and take it on deck the order was obeyed though sid in his terror was not able to render much assistance the bateau was taken on deck to assist the sailing of the isabel and also to prevent the pursuers from seizing it if they should unfortunately come near enough to do so stop your boat i say yelled the slave hunter after they had pulled for a few moments with the most determined zeal can't stop replied dan stop her or i'll fire into you gossifus exclaimed sid whose teeth were still chattering with fear dan made no reply and concluded not to answer any more questions are ye gone to stop her demanded the pursuer i believe you've got that nigger on board and if you don't heave to i'll fight ye up with a bullet bring up the guns sid said dan with forced coolness wa 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 the guns said dan fiercely as he stamped his foot upon the flooring to emphasize his meaning gossifus i done think but sid disappeared in the cabin without giving those on deck the benefit of his thoughts now lily you must go into your cabin lie down in your berth for they may fire upon us said dan don't be alarmed there are only three men in that boat and we can certainly beat them off i will not leave you dan i am not afraid of the bullets i only fear at that moment the report of a gun startled them and the ball whistled close by dan's head End of chapter thirteen recording by scarlet louisiana chapter fourteen of watch and wait the young fugitives by oliver optic this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter fourteen The Battle for Freedom. Tuck the helm, Sid, and mind how you steer, said Dan, with earnestness, as he rose from his seat and seized one of the guns. Hossifus! exclaimed Sid, aghast at the thought. Wa, wa, wa! Take the helm! repeated the resolute skipper with a decision which left no alternative for the boy pacifus dis child don't want to set there and be shooted there is no more danger there than there is anywhere else take your place and don't be a coward if you want to be free you must fight for it now golly dis nigger ain't afeard but sid don't want to be shooted case you can't do without sid but the trembling foremast hand took his place at the tiller he continued to mutter to himself as though he was repelling the charge of cowardice which had been fastened upon him come lily you must go into your cabin now added dan tenderly as he turned to lily this is no place for you oh i'm not afraid of the guns dan only of the slave hunters and i cannot hide myself from them you may escape if you stay in the cabin and you can do no good here i shall feel better to know that you are in a place of safety i'm not afraid dan really 
I am not, replied she earnestly. But you are in our way here, Lily. Do go into your cabin and lie down in your berth. I will if I am in the way. If we have to fight, it will be right here, and I am determined to resist to the last. I will go. And Dan led her to the door of her cabin. She entered and threw herself upon the cushions of the berth, and Dan, satisfied that she was in a place of comparative safety, turned his attention to the defense of his party. "'Can you handle a gun?' said he, turning to Quinn, who appeared to be as cool and resolute as the skipper. "'Well, I done shoot some,' replied Quinn. "'Take a gun, then.' "'Wah! Wah! Wah!' gasped Sid. "'Silence, Sid. Keep both eyes on the sails, or I'll put a bullet through your head. I didn't expect you would be a coward at such a time as this. This child ain't a coward, answered Sid, rising from his seat. Sit down and mind your helm, then. Give me de gun, and I'll show you Sid ain't no coward, no how. You never fired a gun in your life. You would be more likely to shoot yourself than anybody else. Mind your helm. That's all we want of you. Possifus. "'Dis child ain't no coward, no how,' growled Sid, as he cast his eyes at the sails. "'Fire away, dar, and show dese folks Sid's no coward.' "'Gwine to fire into dem folks in de boat?' asked Quinn. "'I am, if occasion requires,' replied Dan, as he discharged the gun he held in his hand in the direction of the pursuers." but I want to let them know that we are armed and able to give as good as they send. I don't want to kill any of them if I can help it. I don't mind killing em. That's what they done to me if days get a chance. Stop your boat! shouted one of the men again, and it was evident from the tones of the speaker that the report of the gun from the Isabel was not altogether favorable to the views of the pursuers. Dan made no reply, but loaded up his gun for further use. "'Stop your boat, or we'll fire into you again!' shouted the speaker. "'If you do, you will get as good as you send,' answered Dan, as he put the cap upon his piece. The reply was followed by another shot from the slave hunters, but the ball whistled far above the heads of the fugitives. Dan took deliberate aim at the boat, and fired, ordering Quinn to do the same. So far as they could discover, neither of the shots took effect. From this time, both parties kept up an occasional firing, but as the night was so dark, and the motion of the boats not favorable to a steady aim, no one in the Isabel was hit and Dan and his companion were not aware of any different result to the other boat. Sid maintained his position at the helm with the steadiness of an old salt who had stood at the wheel in a hundred battles, and Dan, witnessing his improved demeanor, began to think his singular conduct had been the result of excitement rather than of timidity. But one thing was painfully evident to all on board of the schooner, that the boat was gaining upon her, and that the wind was gradually dying out. There was no hope for them except in their own right arms. They must fight for liberty, fight for the rights which they had boldly reassumed. Dan and Quinn were fully determined upon this course, and if they could bring Sid up to a sense of duty on this trying emergency, there would be some chance of success. As it was, the odds were against them. The pursuers were probably men accustomed to the use of arms, while all in the Isabel were, to say the least, very indifferent marksmen. Hitherto they had fired at a dark mass on the water, for they could not distinguish the enemy in the gloom of the night, and the pursuers had been subject to the same disadvantage. A nearer approach to each other of the contending parties would enable both to obtain a more accurate aim, and the work of death 
could not be much longer postponed. "'De wind's clean gone,' said Sid, as the heavy sails of the Isabel began to flap idly in the brails. "'Sid, you must fight,' added Dan earnestly. "'Possifus!' exclaimed Sid, rising and seizing a boat-hook that lay on the quarter. "'Dis child will fight for certain. "'Good, Sid, you are a brave fellow. "'You deserve to be free, and you shall be. "'Possifus! Don't tell Sid he's a coward, "'case he ain't no such ting, no how.' "'I didn't mean that, Sid, and I take it all back,' added Dan. "'The boat has lost her headway now.' They will be upon us in a moment or two. Stand firm, Sid, and break the head of any man that attempts to get into the boat. Yes, sir, that's just what I's gwine to do. I'll break the head of any nigger hunter that's gwine to come in dis boat for certain. Now stoop down, both of you, and let them fire over our heads as they come up. Dan crouched down the bottom of the Isabel, with the gun ready for use, when the decisive moment should arrive. Quinn and Sid did the same, and the intrepid skipper proceeded to give them such instructions for repelling the assault as the occasion required. All of them were to keep their places till the pursuers were close alongside, when the four guns, which were ready for use, were to be discharged. They hoped this would be sufficient to drive them off. If it should not, a fifty-six pound weight taken from the ballast in the run was to be pitched into the boat as she came alongside which would break out a hole in its bottom and sink it before the enemy could get on board sid was then to do duty with his boat hook and the others with similar weapons the slave hunters showed some hesitation in boarding the schooner the guns which had been fired from her had undoubtedly inspired them with a proper respect for those on board of her. The Isabel lay with her sails hanging loosely from the gaffs for half an hour, and still the enemy did not come up to her. "'We's gwine to have a shower,' said Quinn. "'And a squall, too, I'm afraid,' added Dan, as he cast his eyes anxiously over the rail. "'To observe a pile of dense black clouds,' which had suddenly rolled up the midnight sky. "'Where's the boat?' asked Sid. "'She lies off here only a little way from us. If she will only keep still till we can get a breeze, we shall be all right.' "'Let em come on. Dis child's all ready for em,' replied Sid. "'Have you got over being scared?' "'Never was scared.' "'You said you were. Sid's only joking, Din. I done feel so kinder stirred up, I done want to holler, make de nigger feel good. Hush, they are coming, exclaimed Dan, whose quick eye detected a stealthy movement on the part of the boat. Allo in the boat thar, shouted the slave hunter. Well, what do you want? We're going to come on board of yer. No, ye are not. You are all dead men if you attempt it. "'What do you want to shoot us for? "'We ain't a-gwine to hurt you. "'You fired first, you infernal chicken thieves. "'We know what you are,' replied Dan, "'who thought it best to class them with these depredators, "'men who frequent the western and southern rivers, "'plundering boats or houses as opportunity presents. "'We ain't no chicken thieves. "'Keep off. We know you,' repeated Dan." This conversation was followed by another pause, during which the careful skipper had another opportunity to examine the weather indications. They were decidedly unfavorable. It was probable that a squall, if not a tornado, would soon burst upon them, and he deemed it prudent, even at the risk of being shot, to haul down the jib topsail, the staysail, and the gaff topsail. This he succeeded in doing, but he had scarcely finished the job, without giving himself time to stow the extra sails, before he saw the boat of the pursuers dashing rapidly towards the Isabel. 
the slave hunters had at last made up their minds what to do they meant to risk the encounter just then a sharp flash of lightning illumined the lake followed by the muttering thunder a few fitful flashes of lightning had before glared on the gloomy scene but now it gleamed fiercely from the sombre clouds and the heavy thunder rolled an almost incessant peal ready ready now said dan earnestly as he sighted his gun at the trio in the boat which the lightning plainly revealed to him all ready replied quinn now give it to them said dan as he discharged his gun and grasped another quinn did the same the pursuer's boat was not more than ten rods from them but from the want of skill in the marksman the discharged proved harmless put in put in yelled one of the slave hunters never mind their firing they can't hit nothing dan and quinn fired again i'm hit roared one of the enemy with a terrible oath don't go no further keep her going replied another we'll fix em in a minute now the boat dashed up towards the isabel but dan as soon as he had fired leaped from his place and seizing the fifty-six pound weight plumped it full into the bottom of the boat the fugitives heard the pine boards crash as the weight broke its way through and went to the bottom of the lake stand by now shouted dan as he seized his club and dealt a heavy blow upon the head of the slave hunter who was in the act of leaping on board the schooner we're sinking cried another of them and the gunwale of the bateau in which they sailed was nearly submerged they had no time to act upon the aggressive it was all they could do to secure their own safety just then the expected squall struck the isabel and though dan had before cast off all the sheets she careened over till the water flowed into the standing room her watchful skipper sprung to the helm and in an instant she righted partially and darted forward like a steed pricked with the spur we are safe exclaimed dan as lily rushed from her cabin startled by the exciting events which had just transpired End of chapter 14 recording by scarlet louisiana chapter 15 of watch and wait the young fugitives by oliver optic this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 15 the fate of the slave hunters haul down the foresail sid shouted dan as the isabel gathered way and forged ahead be quick but be careful of yourself with the assistance of quinn sid got the foresail in though it was not without a deal of hard tugging for the wind now blew a fierce gale as soon as sail was thus reduced the sheets of the jib and mainsail were secured and the schooner lay down to her work dashing through the water at a furious rate we are all right now lily said dan go into your cabin again or you will be blown away were any of you hurt in the fight asked she as loud as she could scream for the wind howled fearfully through the rigging of the schooner no we are all well and hearty go to the cabin lily she returned to her place of security and seemed to be satisfied that the hour of peril had passed for the thunder and the lightning the dashing waves and the roaring wind had no terrors compared with those produced by the presence of the slave hunters the isabel labored fearfully in the heavy squall and it was only by the exercise of all his skill that dan could keep her right side up he was obliged as the gusts of wind struck her to ease off the sheets and to luff her up by the glare of the blinding lightning he obtained the position of the boat in the lake or he might have run her on shore and with the beautiful craft 
wrecked all the hopes of his party. Here, Sid and Quinn, stand by to reef this mainsail. We can't stand this long, said Dan, as he threw the Isabel up into the wind. Possifus, yelled Sid, above the howling of the tempest. We all go to de bottom for certain. No, we won't. Stand by and work lively. Let go the peak halyards, replied he, as he cast off the throat halyards on the other side. Haul down the sail as fast as you can, Quinn. With the jib still drawing full, the Isabel continued steadily on her course, while Dan and Sid put a double reef in the mainsail. Quinn, standing at the helm in the meantime, and acting under the direction of the skipper. Now, up with it, added Dan, when the reef points were all taken up. The mainsail was hoisted, and again the Isabel dashed madly on her course, for she had now all the sail she could carry in that fierce blow. Dan stood at the helm with his eyes measuring the distances, as the vivid lightning revealed the bearings of the shores. Sid was ordered to the forecastle to keep a sharp lookout ahead, while Quinn was directed to bail out the boat, for at least a hog's head of water had poured in over the side when the flaw struck her. The wind came in heavy gusts, each one of which threatened to knock down the Isabel, and if her skipper had not been a thorough boatman, such must have been her fate. By skillfully meeting the flaws as they struck her, he prevented her from capsizing. Under ordinary circumstances, he would have deemed it highly imprudent to carry any sail, and would have anchored the boat with a long cable. But this was the battle of freedom, and success was worth any risk and any peril which it might require. The tempest, however, was of short duration. When the rain began to pour in torrents, the gale subsided, the reefs were shaken out, and finally the foresail was set again. The wind continued to blow pretty fresh, but all danger was at an end. What do you pose come of dim men? asked Quinn as he finished his task of bailing out the boat. I don't know, but I feel confident that not all of them are able to tell what has happened to them. One of them was hit with the shot, added Quinn, and I struck one over the head with a fender. Dem two must be gone killed dead for sure, said Quinn, with solemn earnestness. Of course, it was not possible for them to get ashore, for their boat was stove all to pieces. Do you know them, Quinn? Yes, sir. Days all nigger hunters. Could they swim? I don't know, but I spect they could. It would not make much difference whether they could or not. The wind blew a hurricane for a few moments. Quinn thinks they must all be dead, replied the man, shaking his head. I'm afraid they are, but it was not our fault. If I thought they were, I would not go down the lake any farther, added Dan, musing. I feels almost certain they's gone to dar reward. May the good Lord have mercy on their sinful souls. Dan considered the question for a time in silence, and finally determined to put the boat about and head her for his destination at the northwesterly corner of the lake. The rain still came down in torrents, but as all on deck were provided with rubber coats belonging to the boat, which had been provided for the use of the planter and his guests on board, they did not suffer and were not even very uncomfortable. But if they had been, it would have not been regarded as a serious matter, amid the fierce excitements of that eventful night. The storm was nothing more than one of those sudden showers which come up so unexpectedly at the south. We once passed through a tornado in Louisiana, which came in a shower that gathered upon a blue sky in less than half an hour. It tore up tall trees as though they had been cornstalks, and rolled up the Mississippi so that it looked like a boiling cauldron. In half an hour more, the sun was shining gaily on the scene of devastation, as though nature had no terrors in her laboratory of forces. 
in an hour after the exciting scene on the lake the isabel had a gentle breeze and fair weather cyd still maintained his position on the forecastle and lily once more ventured into the standing room dan gave her a minute account of the affray with the slave hunters and concluded by stating his belief that all three of them had been drowned in the lake lily shuddered at the thought for the taking of a human life even in defense of the freedom which she valued more highly than life itself seemed a terrible thing to her gentle heart perhaps they are not dead said she perhaps not but it is hardly possible that they could have swum ashore we were at least three miles from the land and their boat was all stove to pieces they might have hold on to de boat suggested quinn but there was an awful sea for a few moments why the water dashed clean over our decks added dan one of them may have saved himself but i am confident the other two must have been lost hi dan shouted cyd from his position at the heel of the bowsprit what is it cyd dar's something over dar added cyd pointing over to leeward as he walked aft what is it cyd tinks it's devoted to slave hunters perhaps it is said dan musing and our wounded or dying enemies may be clinging to it shall we save them hossifus they kill us if we does exclaimed cyd love your enemies said quinn piously let us save dem if we can we can tie dar hands and fetch em ober dar i don't think they are there we must save their lives added the gentle lily and perhaps lose our own but i will overhaul the boat to satisfy myself whether the men were lost or not said dan as he let out the main sheet and put up the helm stand by with the boat hook cyd in a few moments the isabel had run up to the wreck of the boat and cyd grappled it with the boat hook there were no men clinging to it but in the bottom of the boat covered over with water lay the body of one of the slave hunters it was probably the one who had been shot he had not been killed at once for he had spoken after he was hit it looked as though he had been drowned in the bottom of the boat where he lay the fugitives were filled with horror at this discovery poor lily had nearly fainted and if cyd had been shot himself he could hardly have made a stronger demonstration quinn uttered many pious ejaculations showing that he had from his heart forgiven this man who an hour before had thirsted for his blood dan though not less impressed than his companions was calm and resolute this body may betray us said he we must sink it in the lake ugh exclaimed cyd with a thrill of horror we have no time to spare added dan briskly bring up another fifty-six quinn the weight was brought up and tied to the corpse of the slave hunter as it lay in the boat dan then ordered his companions to tip the boat over but quinn asking for a moment's delay threw himself upon his knees and commenced an earnest prayer in behalf of the deceased supplicating forgiveness for his bloodthirsty enemy dan listened reverently to the prayer while lily sobbed as though the departed slave hunter had been her dearest friend instead of the bitter foe of her race the service was ended the boat was careened till the body rolled out and disappeared in the depths of the lake may de good lord have mercy on his poor sinful soul for de love of jesus sake exclaimed quinn as the corpse sank to its resting place make fast the boat to that cleat on the quarter cyd said dan as he hauled aft the sheets and put his helm down cyd obeyed and the isabel filled away upon her course again lily was calmer now but she was still much impressed by the solemn and awful scene of which she had just been a witness it's all over now lily don't think any more about it said dan in soothing tones it is terrible isn't it dan replied she with a shudder it is lily 
but there was no help for it. All that we have done was in self-defense. But it is awful to think of killing them. It is better as it is than if we had let them take us. Did you really mean to kill them, Dan? Not if I could help it, but I would have killed a dozen of them rather than be carried back into slavery. We didn't kill em, Missy Lily, interposed Quinn. They done drowned. De good Lord strike em down just like he did de Egyptians in de Red Sea in de midst of their wickedness. We didn't kill em, Missy Lily. That's it, Lily, added Dan, endorsing the explanation though the religious aspect of the case was not so strongly impressed upon his mind as upon that of his pious companion. "'We might have saved them,' continued the gentle-hearted girl, who derived but little consolation from the words of Quinn. "'You might have taken them on board when the squall came. "'Why, Lily, I had just smashed their boat with my own hands, and I wasn't going to put my head into the lion's mouth, it is best as it is, Lily. The death of these men will remove all danger from our path, for no one has seen us except them. But how awful, sighed she. I told you, Lily, before we started, that terrible things might happen to us. You shall be free. Let this thought comfort you. But it did not comfort her, and she continued to bewail the catastrophe that had befallen the slave hunters, till the attention of her companions was called to the position of the Isabel. Dar's land on de both sides of us, called Cid, who had again been stationed at the heel of the bowsprit to act as lookout man. All right, I see it, responded Dan. Quinn, let go the foresail halyards. How does it look ahead, Cid? Dark as de back of dis child's hand. Look out sharp. Do dat for certain. The Isabel continued slowly on her course, for the woods on the shore now began to shelter the sails from the full force of the wind. The corner of the lake grew narrower with every moment she advanced, till the boat was not more than a couple of rods from either shore. She was running up one of the tributaries of the lake. Presently the creek was less than thirty feet wide, and having passed round a bend so as to hide her from the open lake, Dan ordered his companions to make fast to a tree as he ran her up to the shore. End of chapter 15 Recording by Scarlet, Louisiana Chapter 16 of Watch and Wait the Young Fugitives by Oliver Optic. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 16 In the Swamp. The place where the Isabel had been moored was in the midst of a gloomy and extensive swamp. Though Dan had never been here before, he had heard of the region, and from the first had determined to conceal his party within its deep and almost impenetrable morasses. The swamp was about fifteen miles in extent from north to south, and ten from east to west. It was full of bayous and lagoons, and inhabited only by herons, alligators, and other wild animals of the southwest. It was impossible to penetrate the swamp without a boat, for the terra firma of the region consisted only of islands covered with trees, most of them surrounded by shallow and muddy waters. It is doubtful whether any human being had ever fully explored this extensive swamp, and Dan was confident that, if he could succeed in making his way with the Isabel to a distance of two or three miles from the lake, his party would be free from intrusion, unless, indeed, the slave hunters made a business of driving them from their covert. The information of the leader of the expedition in regard to the swamp was exceedingly limited. All he knew had been derived from Colonel Rabin, who, in conversation with some of his friends, had mentioned the region, and given a partial description of it. He had learned that the bayou, which was the outlet of the waters of the swamp, 
was obstructed by fallen timber a short distance from the lake. As runaway slaves could not live in this desolate place, there had been no occasion to pursue them into its deep recesses. The party on board the Isabel were very much fatigued by the labor and excitement of the night, and when the schooner was safely moored, Dan declared that nothing more should be done until the party had rested themselves. It was not yet daylight, and the boat was in a secure position. "'But we must not all go to sleep,' added Dan. "'I intend to keep a watch night and day while we stay in this place, if it should be for a year.' Hossifus, what's the use of keeping de watch? yawned Sid, as he stretched himself and opened his mouth wide enough to take in a small alligator. Suppose half a dozen slave hunters should come up here while we are all asleep, replied Dan sharply. Pose they come when we're all awake. What din? We can beat them off as we did those last night. Gossifus, some of us get killed for sure. If they keep shooting with de guns, better die than be taken, Sid. We must believe this before we can be sure of success. That's what I's gwine to do, added Quinn. Dis child will fight till they ain't nothing left of him. Ye can be sure of dat. Possivus din. If you's all gwine to fight, Sid ain't gwine to be out of de passion for certain. I's don't know much about de guns but Sid can split a two-inch plank a button again it. I can shoot, but I can butt, grinned Sid. You can bet your life this child ain't no coward, no how. You did very well last night, Sid, and I hope you will stand up to your principles, said Dan. What's dim? What do you think, Sid? Hossifus, Sid thinks he's sleepy, yawned he, opening his mouth in a fearful gape. Eyes stand up to dat for sure. Very well, but one of us shall stand watch while the others sleep. Which shall it be? I'll be de fuss. I done sleep some last night, said Quinn. You didn't shut your eyes once. Who's turn next? Sid's for certain. You done a big ting last night, Dan. We all done gwine to de bottom of de lake or de nigger hunters hab us for sure. If twain't for you, Dan. You can sleep all day. I'm very tired and need rest, for we have hard work before us. But you must keep awake, whoever is on the watch. Our lives depend upon the man on the watch. You can trust me, Dan, replied Quinn. So ye can me, added Sid. Dan examined all the guns to see that they were in condition for immediate use, and then turned in to obtain the rest he so much needed. Lily had already retired, and before the weary skipper could close his eyes, Sid was snoring like a sleepy alligator. Quinn was tired and sleepy, as well as his companions, but it was a matter of conscience with him to keep awake. He walked up and down the standing room in his bare feet, that the noise might not disturb the sleepers to guard against the possibility of being unfaithful to the solemn duty which had been imposed upon him. The sun rose bright and clear, and the solitary sentinel still kept vigil over the sleeping party in the cabin. Two hours, four hours elapsed, and Quinn still paced the deck. It was full six hours before the sleepers showed any signs of life. Lily was the first to wake and come on deck. In a whisper she told Quinn to go to his berth and permit her to keep the watch. At first he objected, but her persistence finally overcame his scruples, and he crept softly to his bunk in the forward cabin. In a few moments he was sleeping as soundly as the rest. The two boys were physically incapable of going without their rest. They were growing, and to sit up all night, filled with anxiety and excitement, was more than they could bear, without nature's strongest protest. They slept hour after hour, and Lily faithfully performed her duty as sentinel over them. The swamp was as still as the house of death. Not a sound was to be heard, for even the alligators were motionless, 
as they sunned themselves upon the dead logs of the lagoons. Dan, having slept eight hours strong, was the first to appear on deck. As he looked at his watch, he was surprised to find it so late, and surprised to find Lily acting as watch on deck. His orders had been disregarded, but Lily was too powerful an advocate with him to permit any blame to be cast upon his companions. She persuaded him that everything which had been done was for the best. Sid soon after made his appearance, having slept all he could at one stretch, and the boys proceeded to get breakfast. Ham and eggs, coffee and toast, constituted the repast, prepared by the skilful hand of Lily, though she was assisted by her willing friends. Quinn did not wake till the meal was ready to be put upon the table, and the party all sat down to this princely banquet in the forward cabin, with the feeling that they were fortunate beyond all other fugitives that had ever escaped to the swamp. After breakfast, or rather dinner, if we designate the meal by the time of day, Lily insisted upon her right to clear off the table and wash the dishes, which was yielded after some discussion, though with the proviso that Sid should assist in the heavy work. While they were thus engaged, Dan and Quinn took the bateau, which had been put into the water before dinner, and rowed up the bayou to explore the region above them. Finding an unobstructed passage for about two miles, they returned. By this time the work of the housekeepers was finished, and the labor of towing the Isabel up the bayou was commenced. As the water was very shallow in some places, they had to follow the channel, and it was sundown when they had moored her to the point they had reached in the bateau. "'That will do very well,' said Dan, as they made her fast to a tree." "'The nigger hunters never find us here for certain,' added Sid, as he dashed the sweat from his brow. "'We are not in a safe place yet,' continued Dan. "'But we are in no hurry, and we won't do any more today. Let us have supper and go to bed.' Lily had already made the tea, and had everything in a forward state of preparation. After supper, the important question of the watch came up again for consideration. We may as well settle this matter once for all, said Dan. I suppose six hours sleep is enough for any of us. Plenty, added Quinn. Dunno, said Sid, shaking his head and gaping as though he had not slept any for a week. Dis child allus go to sleep at eight and wakes up at five. How long's dat, Dan? Nine hours. That's enough for a hog. Nuff for a nigger, too. I have got a plan all ready and if you agree to it, we will adopt it, added Dan. Use de cap'n, and whether we agree to it or not, you must have your own way, continued Sid. Not at all. We'll have no captain here. We are not at sea, and we will all be equal. What we do will be for our own safety. I intend to keep my watch and do my share of the work, so you needn't grumble, Sid. Possifus, Sid never grumble in his life. You seem to think that I want to make you do more than your share. No, sir. I tink you do more'n your share, Dan. Sid ain't nothin' but a nigger, and you's almost a gentleman. Come, come, Sid. I shall be angry if you talk in that way. I am just the same as the rest of you. Hossifus! Wa, wa, wa! That'll do, Sid. You's got all de brains, and knows jist what to do and where to go. Gossifus! Wa! Well, what become of us without Dan? That's just what I tinks, added Quinn. You does de tinkin, and we does de wook. I shall do my part of the work. Now listen to me, and I will tell you how I think the work ought to be divided. We'll go to bed at nine o'clock, and turn out at five. Dim zum, added Sid. I will take the first watch tonight, till one o'clock, and Sid the second, till five in the morning. "'But where's my watch?' demanded Quinn. "'At five o'clock you shall turn out and get breakfast. "'Tomorrow night it shall be your first watch and my second, "'and Sid shall get breakfast the next morning. "'Then Sid shall have the first watch the third night, "'and Quinn the second, and I will get breakfast. "'That makes a fair division, I think.' "'That's all right,' added Quinn. "'Those who sleep but four hours in the night,' 
can sleep during the day if they wish. Yes, when de work's done, said Quinn. We shall not have much work to do after we get settled, replied Dan. All that's very fine, added Lily, who had been listening to the arrangement, but I shall not consent to it. I intend to get breakfast myself. No, Lily, remonstrated Dan. If you do all the cooking, you will have to work harder than any of the boys. One of us will do the heavy work on deck, and you shall attend to the table. I am willing you should do your share of the work, if you insist upon it, but not more than your share. We shall have nothing to do but eat and sleep when we get the boat in position. Lily insisted for some time, but was forced to yield the point at last, for neither Dan nor his companions would consent to her proposition. At nine o'clock, Lily went to her cabin, and Quinn and Sid were soon sound asleep in their bunks. At one o'clock, Sid was called, and Dan gave him his watch, that he might know when to call Quinn. It was a difficult task for the sentinel to keep awake, but I believe he was faithful this time in the discharge of his important duty. At five, Quinn was called, and Sid immediately proceeded to make up for lost time. End of chapter 16 Recording by Scarlet, Louisiana Chapter 17 of Watch and Wait The Young Fugitives by Oliver Optic This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 17 Sid Has a Bad Fit Sid was roused from his slumbers at nine o'clock to assist in working the Isabel farther into the swamp, and in the course of the day she was safely moored in her permanent position. The quick eye of Dan had detected the admirable fitness of this place both for concealment and defense. It was not more than three miles from the lake. The Isabel was secured between two islets in the midst of a broad lagoon, the channel between the two portions of land was only wide enough to admit the boat, and the shore was covered with an impenetrable thicket of bushes and trees, so that the fugitives were obliged to strip the sailboat and take out her masts before they could move her into the narrow bayou. The next day, when the morning work on board was done, they commenced the task of concealing the Isabel more effectually from the view of any person who might possibly penetrate the swamp. A half-decayed log was thrown across the channel, and green branches stuck in the ground till the boat could not be seen. A coat of green paint was then put over the white one, and the party were satisfied that no one could discover their retreat, unless he happened to blunder upon it. In these preparations a great deal of hard work was done, but the feeling of security which they procured amply compensated for the labor. When it was done, the fugitives enjoyed a season of rest, and for a week they did nothing but eat and sleep, though a strict watch was kept all the time to guard against a surprise. But this was an idle and stupid life, and even said, who had formerly believed that idleness was bliss, began to grow weary of it. A few days more were employed in building a bridge from the deck of the boat to the island, in establishing a kitchen on shore, and in making such other improvements on board and on the land as their limited experience in the swamp suggested. After every change and addition which the ingenuity of the fugitives could devise had been completed, the time again began to hang heavily on their hands. It was a happy thought of Lily that Dan should open a school for the instruction of Quinn and Sid, and half the day was very pleasantly occupied in this manner. At the end of a month, both of these pupils were able to read a little from Dan's testament, and they continued to make good progress during the remainder of their residence in the swamp. At the end of a month, Dan saw with dismay the inroad which had been made upon the supply of provisions. The addition of one person to the party had deranged his calculations, for Quinn was blessed with a tremendous appetite. It was necessary 
that a sufficient quantity of the bacon and crackers should be reserved for the voyage that was yet before them which might be a month in duration or even longer this supply had been carefully stowed away in the forehold and at the rate they consumed their provisions the remainder would not last them two months dan communicated his doubts and fears on this subject to quinn and sid who immediately became very wise and suggested a dozen expedients to meet the difficulty sid proposed to forage on a plantation which was immediately condemned as involving too much risk quinn thought they might go to the nearest store and purchase food as both dan and lily had considerable sums of money this also was too dangerous what's do you stoppin here so long asked quinn the search for us has not ended yet replied dan but dey won't take no more of us in two months from dis year time very true but the water will be so low that we can't get out of the lake in less than one month from now we must stay here till next spring added dan decidedly wha wha what ye gwine to stop here a whole year fur demanded sid with his usual impetuosity when would you leave when de water gets high in de fall if we go to sea in the fall or winter we shall meet with terrible storms in the gulf we should perish with the cold or founder in a gale we may have to be at sea a month we shall have to meet our greatest perils after we leave this place well i s'pose you knows best dan and we's gwine to do just what you say replied quinn meekly dimsum dan you just tell dis child what you wants done and we's gwine to do nothing but do it said sid but we must have something to eat while we remain here added dan dat's so niggers can't lib without eatin we can do as the indians did we can hunt and fish suggested dan sartin plenty of ducks and geese pigeons and partridges and we have fowling pieces with plenty of powder and shot but none of us are hunters and i'm afraid we shall not have very good luck in shooting game it was decided that dan and quinn should try their luck on the following day and having taken an early breakfast they started in the bateau rowing down the bayou in the direction of the lake dan was provided with a fowling piece while quinn was to try his luck as a fisherman the former was landed at a convenient place while the latter pushed off into the deep waters of the lake each to exercise his craft to the best of his ability on the shore of the lake dan saw an abundance of wild ducks but they were so very wild that he found a great deal of difficulty in getting near enough to risk the expenditure of any portion of the precious ammunition which was to last a year he fired twice without injuring the game and began to think that he was never intended for a sportsman the third time he wounded a duck but lost him this was hopeful and he determined to persevere at the next shot he actually bagged a brant and what was better he believed he had got the hang of the business so that he could hunt with some success we will not follow him through the trials and disappointments of a six hours tramp but the result of his day's shooting was five ducks and one goose with which he was entirely satisfied with the game in his bag he hastened back to the place where quinn had landed him in the morning the other sportsman had been waiting two hours for him and had been even more fortunate than his companion having captured about a dozen good-sized catfish the result of the expedition was very promising and the food question appeared to be settled with light hearts they pulled back to the camp as dan had christened their dwelling-place in the swamp where is sid asked dan as he hauled the boat through the dense thicket which concealed the isabel from the gaze of any outsiders he is here on deck replied lily with a troubled expression something ails him what's the matter i don't know he is very sick and i am so glad you have come added the poor girl 
who appeared to have suffered an age of agony in the absence of the hunter. Dan was alarmed, for he had not yet considered even the possibility of the serious illness of any member of the party, and Lily's announcement conjured up in his vivid imagination visions of suffering and death. He was full of sympathy, too, for his companion, to whom he was strongly attached. With a heart full of painful and terrible forebodings, he leaped upon the deck of the Isabel and rushed to the standing-room, where Cid lay upon the floor. The sufferer had evidently just rolled off the cushioned seat, and was disposed in the most awkward and uncomfortable position, into which the human form could be distorted. Dan and Quinn immediately raised him tenderly from the floor and placed him upon the cushions. This movement seemed to disturb the sufferer, and he opened his eyes, muttering some incoherent words. At the same time, he threw his arms and legs about in a frightful manner. Dan was quite as much puzzled and alarmed as Lily had been. He did not know what to do for him. His experience as a nurse had been very limited, and his knowledge of human infirmities was extremely deficient. "'What ails him?' asked Lily, whose anxiety for the patient completely beclouded her beautiful face. "'I don't know,' replied Dan, hardly less solicitous for the fate of his friend. "'How long has he been sick?' "'After you went away, I was busy in the cabin for two or three hours, taking care of the dishes and cleaning up the place. When I came on deck, he seemed to act very strangely. I never heard him talk so fast before. He said he felt sick.' and thought he should vomit. He was so weak he could not walk. When he tried to do so, he staggered and fell. I helped him upon the seat, and then he seemed to be asleep. I bathed his head with cold water. When he waked up, he was stupid, and I was afraid he would die before you got back. I didn't know what to do, so I gave him some brandy. How much did you give him? asked Dan. Only about half a tumbler full as much as you gave Quinn when he was sick. Poor fellow! You don't know how much I have suffered in your absence. During this conversation, Quinn, who had more skill as a physician and nurse than his companions, had been carefully examining the patient. What do you think of him, Quinn? asked Dan, as he turned from Lily to consult with him. I tink dar's hope for Sid, replied he, a queer smile playing about his mouth as he glanced at the anxious leader of the party. "'Do you?' "'Then you understand the case, do you?' "'Yes, sar. I do for sartin. My old massa used to have just such fits as dat. added Quinn, his countenance beaming with intelligence. "'What did you do for him?' "'Nuttin, but put him to bed and let him sleep it off. I tink cold water good for him. That's what missus used to do for old massa when it had it very bad. At the suggestion of Quinn, Sid was placed outside of the washboard, and half a dozen buckets of cold water were dashed upon him by the relentless hand of the negro nurse. Wah! 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 roared Sid, as the first bucket fell upon him. See, dar! exclaimed Quinn triumphantly. He done get better so quick. Give him some more. And he dashed another pailful upon him. "'Go away, Dar!' cried Sid, trying to rise. But Dan held him fast. "'Dat do him heaps of good,' added Quinn, and he continued to apply the harsh remedy. "'Don't do it any more, Quinn,' interposed Lily, who seemed to think the remedy was as bad as the disorder. "'Do him power up good. Drive to fit right away from him,' answered Quinn, as he remorselessly dashed another bucket of cold water upon the patient. That's what they called a water cure. "'Go away, Dar!' screamed Sid. "'Luff this child alone!' "'Don't, Quinn. He does not like it,' said Lily. "'Posey don't. Nobody likes the medicine.' "'But you may kill him,' added Dan. "'Kill him? Don't you see he's growing better all the time?' Dar, that'll do, replied Quinn, as he carried the bucket to the forecastle. What, what, what's the matter? demanded Sid. Do you feel better, Sid? asked Dan tenderly, 
as he permitted the patient to roll over into the standing-room yes sar i's born way down pon de missip i's crossed de river on a cottonwood chip roared sid trying to sing a familiar song why he is crazy exclaimed lily yes missy he's crazy but he soon get over it answered quinn laughing why do you laugh quinn you don't seem to be at all concerned about him added lily bad fit missy what ails him bad fit missy my old massa used to have lots of dim fits chuckled quinn but what kind of a fit is it quinn nothin missy only sid done drink too much whiskey and get drunk dat's all End of chapter seventeen recording by scarlet louisiana